Welcome to lecture 10, Poor at Probability. As human beings, we are terrible at probability. It's something that just does not color, come naturally to us, and it's difficult. It's difficult to think about probability. We actually have this sense of coincidence. Like, what are the odds of any coincidence happening? You know, in a city of a million people, a million to one coincidence should happen to somebody every day. The lottery of fallacies along these same lines, it's not what are the odds of John Smith winning the lotto, but what are the odds of anyone winning the lotto? And actually the odds of somebody winning that lotto are pretty darn good. We don't understand about large numbers. There are patterns in large numbers. We don't understand really all of the, what large numbers really are. They're so incredibly big. We search for connections. Uh, psychics do cold readings where they'll say a lot of things and you use your confirmation bias and your forer effect and you pick out what's relevant to you and then you give that meaning. Meanwhile, you forget everything else. But what we true do is truly underestimate how probable some of these guesses actually are. That you know somebody that their name begins with E. That there's something to do with water around or there's greenery around. You, you, we truly underestimate how probable some of these guesses are actually, actually are, and we forget the things, they're misses, we forget those psychic misses, we don't pay attention to them at all, we focus on their hits. And we use this confirmation bias, and it seems like the psychics are really being psychic. We love antidotes. Antidotes are these personal stories that people tell. They're uncontrolled observations. They're subject to all sorts of biases. And we look at antidotes, we're really not aware of our own data mining. Going through all of this stuff and picking out the information that's relevant to us. Picking out the information that supports us. We're also very good at retrofitting. Retrofitting is a great way for genera generating hypothesis. I go through all of this data and then I come up with a hypothesis. But that's backwards. Now what I need to do is take this hypothesis I came up with and create a study and go forward. If it proves that, that hey, this hypothesis is valid, then I need to publish the study and let somebody else try it. Come up with other studies. Try and figure out, is there any other way of explaining uh, what, what just occurred? This would be retrofitting. A good example of this is the Bible Code. Some of you may have heard about the book, The Bible Code, where uh, through some sophisticated computer al algorithms, these authors were able to come up with hidden messages within the Bible. Well, the law of large numbers says, yes, there are going to be messages within any uh, large volume of stuff. So you could take Shakespeare, you could take War of the, uh, see, uh, the, the uh, oh gosh, no, I can't think of a book. Um, uh, the collected works of anybody and apply an algorithm and come up with hidden messages. It's just the law of large numbers with the confirmation bias thrown in here that yes, there is going to be messages. Another great example is Nostradamus. Very, very vague predictions. And through retrofitting, we take the events that occurred in, in world history and we fit them to his predictions. We work backwards. Turns out that when Nostradamus actually made specific predictions, every single one of them did not occur. But we don't hear about those. We don't like those. It doesn't fit with our confirmation bias. It doesn't fit with our belief system. If we take the events that occurred to the world, then we retrofit them into the predictions. Things seem to work out pretty good. We have a, a very poor understanding of what randomness really is. 
If I was to ask you to come up with 10 random numbers, chances are you would not come up with a true random string. Randomness is something that we just simply don't understand. And when we have large numbers and we have randomness, randomness, we frequently get what's called the cluster effect. This is how we get uh, our astrological signs, how we get the constellations. The, because the stars cluster in a certain way, we give meaning to these clusters. And in random uh, clusters, in random data, there are going to be clusters. Things are going to not be what we consider random. But in large numbers, and especially in random large data, there are going to be clusters of, of events, clusters of idea, clusters of data. And our mind puts these clusters together into meaningful holes. A good example of this in sports is the hot hand effect, or the high performance streak, the hot hands effect that uh, a sports player is suddenly having a good game or a good season. And we start putting meaning to this, but in reality, probably it is, is just the cluster effect, that it played so many games, it's bound to have a good game. Played so many seasons, he's bound to have a good season. You know, above and beyond the, the individual skill level, everybody is bound to have a good game, a good season from time to time. This would be the hot hands effect. Nothing to it other than mathematics. We look at a gambler's fallacy. The gambler's fallacy is the mistaken notion that the odds for something uh, that's fixed are going to change, either increase or decrease, according to recent occurrences. You know, here at the slot machines, every time you pull the handle, you have equal odds of winning or losing. Every time you pull that handle. It doesn't matter whether you've lost 500 times in a row, that next handle pull has the same odds of winning or losing as the 500th pull. That 501st pull has the same odds as all of those other pulls. But the gambler's fallacy says, I've lost, this machine has been losing and losing and losing and losing. It's bound, it's time to pay off. Or sometimes it's the other way around. This machine has been paying off so well, it's bound that this machine is going to start losing again. This is the gambler's fallacy. And Las Vegas takes advantage of this, really does. An example that we don't understand uh, probability and randomness, if I was to take a coin and flip it 10 times, 10 of those times it came up heads. What are the odds that the 11th flip it's going to come up heads? Now if you're in the gambler's fallacy you might think, well you know what, it's on a streak. This coin is on a streak, it's had 10 heads in a row, of course it's going to have an 11th head. Or you might be in the gambler's fallacy the other way around. It's like, no, this has already had 10 heads in a row. It's bound now. It's due to come up tails. Each flip of that coin, it doesn't matter whether it's the first flip or the 11th flip, each flip of that coin has a 50-50 chance of coming up heads or coming up tails. It's just a cluster. If we flip a coin 10 times, Chances are more than five will be heads and more than five will be tails. If we flip the coin a hundred times, those odds probably even out a little bit more. If we flip the coin a thousand times, chances are you're gonna come pretty close to 50-50. If we flip, flip the coin a million times, eventually we're gonna come up with a pure 50-50 split between heads and tails. A little video here that uh, can't play just yet. <clears throat> How about this one? What are the odds of you dying of a shark attack? Anybody know? How about what are the odds of you dying in a lightning strike? Or maybe what are the odds of you dying by getting struck on the head with a coconut? What do you have higher odds of dying? Do you have higher odds of dying through a shark attack? Is there a higher probability that you're going to die from a coconut falling on your head or a lightning strike? And some of it depends on where you live. And 
Whichever one you choose, what information did you use to make that decision? It's a tough one. You know, we have a strong tendency, if the, the news reports is reporting a lot about shark attacks, we have this strong tendency to think shark attacks actually occur more often. If the news is reporting about lightning strikes, if just last night on the news I heard about somebody getting struck by lightning, we have a strong tendency to think lightning strikes actually occur more often. Well, in reality, about one person a year dies from a shark attack. And that's a lifetime risk of just anybody in the United States of one in 3.7 million. Lightning strikes uh, kill about 47 people a year in the United States. That's a lifetime risk of one in 79,000. So significantly higher risks. But coconuts falling on your head, that happens about three times a year. So even, you know, higher than shark attacks and less than lightning strikes. We tend to overestimate risks. Specifically, if we see something occur, even if we see it on, uh, whether in person or on television, we have a strong tendency to worry about events that are very, very rare, but not worry at all about events that are highly, much more likely to occur. For example, accidental poisonings kill about 19, over almost 19 and a half thousand people each year. And yet we don't hear about these in the news and it doesn't even come up in our thoughts. We don't worry about accidental po poisoning nearly as much as we worry about getting struck by lightning. There's a concept called playing with house money. It's very similar to the uh, found money effect I talked about in another lecture. <clears throat> that we're at a casino, we're gambling and we do some winnings we get some winnings, we're much more likely to spend those winnings right back. When we have the house money that we're playing with, although it's sitting in front of me, it is my money, it has the value of whatever that money is, I value it less. I start increasing my bets. My risk aversion actually lessens. Even though the odds in that game have not changed, whether I'm playing with the money I walked in with or I'm playing with the money that I won. The money I walked in with is my own money. And the money that I won is my own money. But we treat those two separately. One I earned hard. It took me years to earn that money. I value that differently than I do the house money, the money that I won from the house. I won that in a few minutes, I got it very easily, so I'm much more likely to raise my bets to take much higher risks. We also have a very strong tendency to overestimate ourselves. We have a strong, strong tendency to overestimate our own abilities. We have a strong tendency to overrate our own knowledge, our own wisdom, our own critical thinking skills, our own memory our own thought processes. We have a very, very strong tendency to overestimate who we are. And this can cause some problems. In the next lecture, I want to talk about our culture in relation to delusions and specifically mass delusions.